Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of The Cross Question. And we've been looking at the series at the issue of whether or not the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was actually crucified according to the Bible. We have our own understanding from the text that we have in Islam, but we have to confine ourselves to the text of the Christian because he will not accept any other text if we give it as a form of proof. So we're having to restrict ourselves to the New Testament. So far we have looked at how the New Testament was put together by voting, by strange table appearances of documents. We've looked at how Paul came into the church and started to change some of the beliefs of the church, going and bringing the message to the non-Jews instead of the Jews as he was commanded by Jesus to be upon him. We are now moving right into the point where the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, says to his disciples, according to the Bible, that they need to go to Jerusalem. And so we are taking up from that point where they are now on their way towards Jerusalem, where the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, in a very, very short time, is going to be captured and taken to be tried and crucified. And we have the whole story of the East as found in Christianity. So that's the point that we are at this time. And so we are, I'm going to read these verses because I know sometimes... When I just quote verses, people don't actually go check them out. So I quote verses and nobody actually looks. So for those of you not going to go check, I want to read them to you and then we will go from that point and make a comment on it afterwards. So the first verses that we're going to be reading from now, it's from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 16. And it goes like this. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth out two of his disciples and said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you have entered into it, you shall find a colt tied. There unto you will see that no man has sat. Loose him and bring him. And if a man says to you, What are you doing? Say unto him, Your Lord has need of him, and straight away he will send it hither. And when they went their way, they found the colt tied at a doorpost at a place where the two ways meet and loose him. A certain of them that were standing there said, What are you doing loosing this colt? And they said unto them that Jesus had commanded that they should let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast garments on it, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments on the way, and others cut down branches of trees and strewed them on the way. And there were many that went before, shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of the father David, who cometh in the name of the Lord. And Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and entered into the temple. And when he looked around about upon all these things, and now the evening tide had come, and he went out with Bethpage to Bethany with the twelve. And in the morrow they came to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out those who sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers. And he sent them out those who sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessels through the temple. This is all found in Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 16. It's a long verse. It's a long story of the disciples being sent. Listen, you must go to this other town. I'm going to wait here. You guys go. I'm going to send you on a secret mission. Go into this town. You're going to see a colt. A colt is like a, an animal. I'll tell you what time. I don't want to tell you what animal because we're going to get to that now. A colt is like a, a small little horse. And he says, you'll see a colt. It's never been ridden by anybody. It'll be tied up where the two roads meet. When you find this colt, I want you to bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you taking this colt? It's not yours. You say to them, my Lord is need of it. And they will say, fine. And as these disciples go on their secret mission to where the two roads meet, and they find this colt tied up exactly as Jesus, peace be upon him, has told them it's going to be tied up, people say to them, what are you doing? And they said, our master is need of it. And they said, no problem, take it. And so he takes it and he brings it to them. And then when he brings the colt there, they put cloths over the colt. Jesus sits on the colt and people take out palm leaves and branches and they put them in front of Jesus and they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and all sorts of other things. 
and he enters into the town. The first thing he does when he enters the town is he goes to the temple and he pushes over tables. He chases people out that are selling things. And he would not allow anyone to carry any vessels through the temple. That's the story. That is what we find in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 16. And now the story goes on as we look into the next account. And that is, according to Mark, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. He didn't have any of these things that were going on like we see the other account gave. He has them going straight into the temple and he looks at all that is going on. He comes back the next day after he sees what's happening in the temple and then he upsets all the tables and drives everybody out and chases the money changes out. Nobody's allowed to bring anything through. But as we saw in Mark, he reports that the tables were turned over that very first day that they entered into Jerusalem. So Matthew and Mark have very different accounts of something as simple as when Jesus arrived or when he didn't arrive. When he went into the temple, when he didn't go into the temple. When he pushed tables over, when he didn't push tables over. One as it's two days later, one it's the same day. One we have him going on donkeys, on on asses, and on colts, and all different animals. The one that happening at another day and not on the same day. Then it goes on to say, And when he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, and listen to the next words, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And so it continues and says, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. This is according to Matthew chapter 21, verse 10 to 12. So, From this account, we have two different versions coming. There's not only one difference in the version of the Gospels regarding Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, but there are a number. What Mark called a cult, remember we called a cult, he said you'll see a cult. Matthew reports, and he says the following in Matthew chapter 21, verses 2 and 5. Matthew chapter 21, verse 2 and 5, Matthew says, And you will find an ass tied and a colt with her, and sit upon an ass, and a colt the foal of the ass. Now an ass and a colt are two different things. The ass is the adult, and the colt is the small one. So here in this version, in Matthew's version, you've got a colt and the ass, so they couldn't even make a decision when recording the story on whether it was the baby Jesus sat on, or whether it was the adult that he sat on. Whether there was one animal there or whether there was two animals there. Whether he was sitting on the one animal or not the other animal. So we find that John, the writer of the fourth gospel, he decides that, okay, these guys don't know what they're doing. They've written both these versions wrong. Maybe they should be disqualified. So Mark and Matthew, he is going to outdo them. So John, the writer of the fourth gospel, he is very fond of elaborating and going into details and explaining unusual events and coming up with things that you won't find any of the other writers writing. That's why the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are grouped together. And John, he plays on his own playground by himself because he writes in a totally different way. He has his own style, own form, and everything, but we'll go into more detail of that, inshallah, a little later. But by the time of writing his Gospel, Christianity had become a distinctly separate religion and broken from its links with Judaism. So during the time of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's writing, it was still very much a part of the Jewish faith. It still had its links, it still had its connection. But by the time John was writing, that link had long time been just separated and broken. And so we have a distinct style and a distinct way of writing that is very different. It had by now become the religion of the Gentiles, the non-Jews that is. And the doctrinal debates had had been going on between the different congregations within Christianity had now become very severe. According to John, Jesus made a number of separate journeys to Jerusalem rather than just one as reported in Mark and Matthew and Luke. In Mark, Matthew and Luke, we just have Jesus appearing one time in his journey towards Jerusalem. But John has his own flavor and his own style. And he is not a writer of the Synoptic Gospels, so he writes at a much greater distance of time to they do. So whereas the Synoptic Gospels record that the journey was undertaken at the end of Jesus' life on earth, John reports that the first of his reported journeys took place 
in the early days of Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist himself, soon after the first miracles were recorded um, in the Bible. So we find that in John chapter 2, Jesus is turning water into wine, but he takes them all the way over to Jerusalem to do this miracle. Now, the commotion at the temple obviously annoyed the Jewish leaders, and of course they would have been very upset by this, because you must remember this is something, the festival that when Jesus' peace be upon him arrives in the area, and especially going into the temple, it's like Hajj season. Now, imagine that you're in the middle of your Hajj as Muslims, and a Christian televangelist, one of these television evangelists, somehow makes his way into the middle of the crowd, and he starts climbing up the car and starts talking. What do you think people will do? There would have been an outrage, an absolute commotion. So commotion at the temple obviously annoyed the Jewish leaders at the day because this is the most sacred time on the Jewish calendar. It was Passover. And so there was a great deal of people that had gathered there. So this man coming in, whether he was a prophet, whether he was the son of God, no matter who he was, coming in and turning over tables and chasing people out and not allowing people to come into the temple, carrying any objects of any sort, would have been something that the leaders would have been very upset about. And it says, in, if we read the account that is given in John chapter 2, verse 18 to 20, the account is given and it says, What sign are you going to show us, seeing that you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And when he said this, the Jews said to them, It took 46 years, was it, that we built this temple, and now you say that you'll rear it up in three days again. Well, it's time for us to take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue, inshallah. In Chicago, America, the historic debate. The Koran has many scientific errors. Between Dr. William Campbell. This Bible contains absurdities as well as innumerable scientific errors. And Dr. Zakir Naik. Why are these so-called scientific claims made which no Muslim can support? Change the minds. Not a single person will be able to prove a single verse of the Quran. The way people think. In conflict with established modern science. Don't miss the historic debate. The purpose of my presentation is not to hurt any Christian's feelings. If I hurt your feelings, I do apologize in advance. The Quran and the Bible in the light of science in Crossfire this Saturday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Distinguished world famous orator who dedicated their lives to convey the message of peace came together at one platform, the International Islamic Conference, with one vision, with one mission, peace mission. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace Mission, next on Peace TV. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back. We're continuing with our series, The Cross Question. Before the break, I was quoting to you from John chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. I sort of paraphrased it a bit. Uh, basically, it says to Jesus, what sign are you going to show us, seeing that you do all these things? What did Jesus do? He turned all the tables over. He chased everybody out. Now the Jewish leaders were very upset. So they came to Jesus and said, What authority do you have to do all these things? Show us what sign. Show us, in other words, show me a verse. Show me an ayah where you get the right to do what you've just did. 
And Jesus answered them and said, Destroy this temple, the one that they were standing in, and in three days I will raise it up again. And the Jews said to him, Forty and six years, forty-six years it took to build this building. And you think you're going to now build it in three days. This is in John chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. So this is the atmosphere that Jesus, peace be upon him, arrived. As at Jesus' trial by the high priest, Jesus was accused of threatening to destroy this exact same temple that he's standing in and the people are asking him. But in John's version, he adds, but he spoke of the temple of his body. You see, because in their trial that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't clarify this. It's up to the reader to interpret. So John has to clarify it for us people. And he says, but he spoke of the temple of his body, not the physical temple that he would destroy. So he's speaking of the temple of his body in John chapter 2, verse 21. It is here that John introduces Nicodemus. Nicodemus is going to play a very, very important role. He is a man who is a ruler of the Jewish community. He's very well known, and he's a very influential man. You can read about him in John chapter 3, verse 1, who was to play a very, very important role in the burial of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night secretly in a previous story that happens earlier in the Bible and professes his faith, and he says that he believes that Jesus is a teacher come from God, and so he is believing that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, is a messenger from God. And so in John's Gospel, we hear of him coming and making this declaration of faith. And it says, And after this, Jesus went into Judea with his disciples, staying there, and was baptized, that we read in John chapter 3, verse 22. So this person is going to play a very, very important part. Now we go to John chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, and it says, A report now reached the Pharisees. Jesus is winning and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was one of the disciples who was baptizing and not Jesus himself. So this is what we read in John chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. This is in conflict with what John writes in his own book in John chapter 3, verse 22, where he reported that the above is clearly a statement that Jesus himself had said. And it says that Jesus stayed there with them and baptized. So if it wasn't Jesus himself who baptized, as John chapter 4, verse 1 to 2 says, it wasn't Jesus himself who baptized one of the disciples, then that contradicts what John chapter 3, verse 22 says, when it says, that he stayed there with them and baptized. It seems that John chapter 4 verse 1 to 4 was so worded for two reasons when we look at it now. The first reason is to assert that Jesus was making more disciples than John the Baptist and to show them how he was superior to John the Baptist. Remember that there was a division that was taking place at that time between the followers of Jesus and the followers of John the Baptist. If you don't know the story, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus, and so he prepared the way, according to the Bible, for the coming of Jesus. And so his disciples were following John the Baptist. Even when Jesus came along, more people were following John the Baptist than Jesus. So what John is trying to do now, I said Paul, maybe, maybe I gave that away, because you can see Paul's influence on John's writing. So the first thing is that we see that he is writing in this style, in this way, that Jesus has got more disciples that he is superior to John the Baptist, whose disciples were still in large number while John had been writing his gospel that we're now reading. The second reason is to find an excuse because, in fact, Jesus had not been a huge success in Judea. This second fact is indicated in John chapter 4, verse 3. So in John chapter 4, verse 3, it says, When Jesus learned this, he left Judea and set out once more for Galilee. Now, if Jesus was in fact winning disciples, then he did not need to leave Judea. So we know that unfortunately from his mission being not a very successful one, Jesus unfortunately, his mission has to end. And he has to go to try and find better soil, to find a place where he would hopefully win more people. Jesus himself testifies in John chapter 4, verse 44. He says, A prophet hath no honor in his own country. Or as some translators say, A prophet is not known in his own town. So he has to leave there. As it is stated before in other texts and writings of John, 
John was writing his gospel at a time when Christianity had become a far more stronger religion amongst the Gentiles than it had amongst the Jews. And we explained that in episodes before. So John reports Jesus' dialogue with a story to show that he was actually supposed to be talking not only to the Gentiles, not only to the Jews, but to the whole of humanity or to everybody. So John in his writing, and you don't find this in the other Gospels, but you find it in John. John reports that Jesus' dialogue with a Samaritan woman took place, and this gives the impression that he conveyed his message even to the Samaritans who the Jews considered as unclean. So a lot of what John does, he is trying to do in in a way to prove that the message that the prophet Esau, peace be upon him, came with was not exclusively for the Jews, which is contrary to what Matthew in his gospel had recorded. Because in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 6 and 7, he says, These Jesus set forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, or into the cities of the Samaritans, you shall not enter, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, in other words, the Jews. So, from Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, he very carefully commands his 12 disciples, and he sends them out with a command saying to them, Do not go to the way of the Gentiles, into the cities of the Samaritans, don't even go there and go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel or the Jews. This is in direct contradiction to what we see John saying. So later when a Gentile woman even comes to Jesus, he asks for help. This is recorded in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 to 26. He answers and said, It is not meant for me to take the bread from the children and give it to the dogs. So Jesus is referring to the non-Jews as dogs. He says, It is not for me to take the bread from the children of the Jews and give it to the dogs. What is he saying by this? He's simply saying that this message is not for you. I cannot help you. I cannot help you. I can do nothing for you because this message is not for you. It's for the Jew that I have been sent. Another messenger will come and do that. And so this is in direct contradiction to what we find John saying now. It also goes on to say in Mark chapter 13, Verses 1 and 2. And they went out to the temple, one of the disciples, and said to them, Master, see what manner of stones and what manner of buildings here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, See thee these buildings. They shall not be one stone upon another. They shall all be thrown down. So Jesus, when speaking of a coming war and a famine and pestilence, he is talking about something similar to what we see in Matthew chapter 22 and what we see in Luke chapter 21. And what is interesting to note is that when these Gospels were written, when Matthew chapter 24 was written and when Luke chapter 21 was written, and they're talking about these one stone will not be on top of the other, when these famines and pestilences will take place, these events had already taken place and they're already part of history. So they were not something that these gospel writers were writing that would happen in the future. These events had already happened by the time they had written these. You see, Christians like to say, well, these books were written 30 to 100 years later. And then when it comes to verses like this, they'll say, yes, yes, but these books were only written 200 years later. So they can't have it both ways. They've got to make up their mind which was written before or after. But we know that these events were already part of history. And so John now mentions another journey to Jerusalem in John chapter 5. He likes to have Jesus going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards to this place. That's because he hasn't got his facts straight. He hasn't got his story straight. So every now and then gets the mix up and he has to bring people backwards and forwards. So in the next story that you see, we have John mentioning his journey to Jerusalem in John chapter 5 where he cites the story of a crippled person lying by the side of the sheep pool known as Bethsaida. It's a very well-known name in Christianity. Many people call their clinics, their hospitals, Bethsaida Clinic, where an angel would come and disturb the water, and whoever was the first person to plunge in after the angel had disturbed the water would recover from whatever affliction had affected him. And since this miracle was nothing to do with Jesus, but had to do with an angel that would come down and disturb the water, we find that nobody mentions it in the Bible except for John because this would absolutely mean nothing. This doesn't prove that Jesus has any miracle power or anything like that. So many versions of the Bible 
Even those that have John chapter 5 omit this miracle. And they leave it out because this miracle would in itself just simply mean a miracle and had absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. So many versions of the Bible simply omit it and don't have it mentioned. The King James Version includes this verse. So does the Revised Bible Version. So does the Living Bible. But the New World Translation, the New English Bible, and the New International Version omit it. And they have written it and reason why they've omitted. They say this is to be found in some less important manuscripts. The conflict with the Jews deepens when the Jews accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. And this we're going to go into in more detail in the next episode. We, there's so much to cover in this. When we get back, we'll continue. So for me, Arib Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donation to IRFI, Al Ryan Bank, Quadrant Court, 48 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK. Pound account number 0113230. IBAN GB52 LOYD 3096340102492. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code. IBOBG B22. Please confirm your bank transfers at admin at peacetv.tv. Support Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Who was the first prophet? Was the prophet the first one to read and write? Did God speak to a prophet? A prophet in a prison. A prophet who commanded the birds, insects, and animals? Want to know more? Join us for Stories of the Prophets. Stories of the Prophets every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. for humanity.
What is Islam's relevance to the sustainability of civilization? This is the single most pressing and crucial issue facing every human being. Islam might have that balance, make it possible for people to live with dignity and to live a decent, comfortable life in this world and, more importantly, to prepare themselves for the hereafter, a life without end. When I was discussing this general topic with some of our speakers, uh, one of the brothers, he, he mentioned that one of the tafsirs of Amarna Mutrafiha. Mutrafin are people of luxury. Yani yeah, people are living at a high level of comfort. And, and the, the verb Amara, one of its meanings is to increase. So there is a, a tafsir that says that when Allah intends to destroy a, a city or a village, that He increases the number of it, people living